everyone. My name is Stephanie, and welcome to Christ Community Church. We still have a few moments before our service begins, so check out what's happening this week at CCC. First of all, thank you for being flexible with the renovations happening in our atrium. I know it may be a little challenging to find your way around today, but don't worry. Next week, all the normal entrances and hallways will be reopened. Plus, in a couple of weeks, the atrium will be put back together and you'll love it. Registration for Summer U is now open. During the last week of June, your kids ages 4th through 5th grade are invited to learn the truth about God's Word through high-energy singing, games, hands-on activities, stories, teaching, small group time, and meeting new friends. Today, we're in week 2 of a 4-week Sunday sermon series called Life in a Hypersexual Culture. It's no secret that from the internet to advertising to cultural expectations, unhealthy views of sex are everywhere. But we believe that God designed our sexuality to be sacred and powerful and point us to a deeper spiritual experience. All of the content will be age appropriate for middle school ages and up. Moms and dads, if you have young years in the room, I encourage you to take some time now to check your kids into our kids' ministry. We also recognize that this topic is difficult to talk about. It may bring up some woundedness or an awareness of a deep desire to seek healing. Every Sunday, we have people ready to pray for you. Please take a moment to stop by the prayer room today after service or submit a prayer request online, and someone will get in touch with you right away. Service is about to begin. Thanks again for joining us today. Be sure to go online to cccomaha.info for more information about today's message, upcoming events, or anything we mentioned.
one voice we sing that out you're never gonna end you're never gonna God is so good. Amen? Amen. Well, welcome. Welcome to Christ Community Church. My name is Mark. I serve here as the lead pastor, and you are the frozen chosen. So glad that you're here in the middle of this winter wonderland, well, spring wonderland, uh, and uh, that you guys have made it out here. Greetings to those of us who are joining. My guest is in record numbers on our online uh, campus. And uh, we're just so glad to be able to be a part of uh, what God's doing here because Jesus is worthy of our worship. Amen? Amen. Hey, we're jumping into a uh, second part of our series on living life or navigating life in a hypersexual culture. Want to let you know we've designed the content to be good for middle school on up. If you've got kids that are younger than that, that you would rather not have be exposed to the subject matter, we have an awesome kids ministry that would love to receive your children, uh, even at this time, and uh, they'd have a great experience in the midst of that. Hey, I've got two announcements that I want to pass on to you, two pieces of good news uh, that I think will be really fun for our church. One of them is that, you know, as Grace University has closed this past year, it's left a gap in our city related to uh, some aspects of Christian education. And I just want to let you guys know that I'm announcing this morning a fresh partnership with Crown College in Minneapolis to open up Crown College Omaha right here in the porch across the parking lot at Christ Community Church. Is that very fun? It's kind of a cool story behind that because Crown College had gone to the Nebraska legislature last summer before we knew the news about Grace University, just sensed the prompting from God to say, hey, let's expand Nebraska, got all the permissions in line, so we've been in conversation about this for six months or so, and it just feels like our building, their vision, what God's doing in the city is coming together for something powerful, so we'll start offering three uh, undergraduate uh, degrees and one master's degree degree in counseling, uh, which of course is perfect because city care will be right next door and uh, there will be some great synergies with that. So I'm pretty excited about that. Hey, the second thing that I want to announce to you today is that the governing board has granted me a sabbatical. 
Now, some of you may wonder what the idea of a sabbatical is. Uh, in general, it's considered to be good practice in churches for lead pastors to get a period of rest and reflection and depth in Jesus. Because the lead pastor role is one that carries an extra amount of weight, spiritually, counseling, decision-making, preaching, all that kind of stuff, uh, puts a load on a lead pastor. And so every seven years or so, uh, they recommend that you get away for a number of months and refresh your soul and fill up your tank again so that you can enter into another season of giving. Well, I've been in ministry 28 years straight uh, with no sabbaticals along the way. And about November, I hit the place uh, where I came to the board and I said, guys, I'm just exhausted and I'm, my spiritual tank is empty and I feel like I need one of those things. And so graciously, uh, they've offered me eight weeks of sabbatical time during the month of May and June. Uh, and then I can add on top of that my normal study and vacation time in July. So you will not see my face for three months at Christ Community Church. Okay, you don't know whether to clap or to boo, right? So let's just all clap together. Yay, Jesus. So glad for that. And we got great speakers lined up for you, Sky Jatani and Mark Moore and, and uh, Ron Dotzler and other people that will be your favorites here in May. We got Global Summit in June with missionaries. We got staff pastors that are going to be here in July. So it's going to be a rocking good time. You will not miss me at all. And uh, I'll be back in August uh, at the end of that. So uh, that's another piece of good news. But the biggest piece of good news is that Jesus is alive, that he died for us, that he rose from the dead, and he offers us new life. Amen. And we remember that this morning uh, with communion. And uh, I want to give you a little thought to think of before we distribute the elements this morning. You know, Jesus said when he passed out the cup to his friends that night before he was about to die, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Or this is the new covenant written in my blood. And have you ever thought about that new covenant? I mean, what, what's he talking about with a new covenant there? Well, for a Jewish person, they would have been very familiar with the old covenants that were in place and a symbol that went with each of them. Go back to the time of Noah and God promised Noah in the what's called the Noahic covenant that he'd never destroy the world by water again. And he gave him a symbol to remind him of that. And the symbol was the rainbow. And then later on, he made a covenant with Abraham called the Abrahamic Covenant. And the covenant was, I will make you a, a, a great people, I'll give you a land, and I'll make you a blessing to all nations. And he gave him a dream with a smoking pot. And that smoking pot was the symbol of the covenant that he had with Abraham. And then there was a third covenant that he gave with Moses called the Mosaic Covenant. And the Mosaic Covenant was a covenant that said, if you will follow my law, you will be my treasured possession in Exodus chapter 19. And the symbol he gave Moses was the law written on tablets of stone for the people to follow. And then the fourth covenant was a covenant with David called the Davidic Covenant. And that covenant was a covenant where he said, David, your kid one of your offspring will rule on the throne of Israel forever and ever. And the scepter and the crown were the symbols of that kingdom that was to come. And here's the incredible thing. Jesus began this brand new covenant with a brand new symbol. And it was a covenant that fulfilled all of the other covenants. That God doesn't want us to be destroyed, but instead he wants us to find life. That God wants us to be a blessing to the entire world. That God wants us to be his treasured possession. And there is a kingdom that will never perish or spoil or fade. And it was all wrapped up in the new covenant that was written in the blood of God's one and only son. And that covenant required everything of God even giving his own kid, for Jesus even to give his own blood for you and for me. So Jesus says, remember that when you drink the cup, when you take the bread. I'm going to invite the communion uh, pastors to come forward. Oh, and I forgot the offering, didn't I? Well, we'll have the communion pastors come forward, and then the offering guys will come up in uh, just a few minutes. And uh, as you receive communion this morning, you'll realize that there are double cups in there. Go ahead and take both the bread and the wine together in the double cup. And then just as God leads you, as God leads you, I pray 
that you'll be able to have the opportunity just in a moment between you and God. I won't come back up and lead this, but just on your own, partake of the bread and the wine as we remember Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, today we recognize that you gave your body and your blood for us. And we come together to remember you, to remember your sacrifice, remember your death, remember your life. We ask that you'll meet with us as we worship you and as we partake in this moment. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You can stay seated for this first song, and we invite you to sing along as you feel comfortable. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died. Before we continue with our next song, we do want to give you an opportunity to worship through your giving. And uh, for anybody who's new to Christ Community Church, we want to let you know that we don't want you to feel any pressure or obligation to give. Ushers, if you have those offering plates, you can come forward now. You know, giving is an extension of our love of God. It's really a way of saying, Lord, I trust you with what you've blessed me with. And how many of you can agree with me in saying that everything we have is from the good hands of our Father, right? Amen, everything that we experience, every breath we take is a gift from him. And so as we surrender our lives to Jesus more and more, giving back financially is just a tangible way to say, Lord, I trust you more and more. And the beauty of it is it can do so much more with the dollars we give uh, together than what we could ever wish to do on our own. So Lord, I ask that you would take these gifts as we continue worshiping through this next song. Would you use them to glorify your name and to bless your kingdom? Amen. These plates will pass. We're going to sing one more song. As soon as that plate goes by you, we invite you to stand and sing with us.
give God thanks and praise today for you are worthy, Lord. You did not spare your own son coming after us. And it's hard for me sometimes to just like wrap my mind around that truth in a fresh way that you considered me, that you considered your family here worth leaving heaven to come to earth. Oh, what great love that is, Lord. And we thank you for it. We thank you. We shout your name. We trust that you're gonna change us. In his mighty name, we pray together. Amen, amen. Can we shout amen one more time? Give him a, a shout of praise. Amen. Well, hey, we're about to jump into our message with Pastor Mark. But before we do, why don't you guys just take uh, 30 seconds right now to greet somebody today. Tell them, hey, tell them how glad you are to see them. Give them a high five, if you will. Tell them how much God loves them. Do that now, and then you can be seated. All right, well, good morning, church. Good to see all of you here today as we uh, have the opportunity to talk about married sex. And uh, I've got to tell you a little bit of a story. About, oh, shoot. Sorry, I clicked. Oh, I clicked too fast. What's going on? Okay, Ig just ignore the screen behind you. Ignore the screen behind you. I got to tell you a little bit of a story uh, about this message uh, because last night I came in to do all of my final tweaks on my message and do a practice run through and I got to the end of my practice run through and God kind of said to my heart, I love this church too much to let you deliver that message to them. <laughs> and uh, so I went back into my office and did a, a rewrite from scratch starting at nine o'clock. Things are a little bumpier than they normally are, so I'm going to invite you guys to give me grace. Can you say grace? grace. For a message that God led me to do uh, at the last minute. And the other thing that I realize is that there is so much pain around this subject. And as I come to talk to all of you guys about sex inside of marriage, I know I've got a huge audience of people who are like single and frustrated, single and very happy, married and frustrated, married and very happy. We got people who are divorced and widowed and have had abortions or struggling with infertility and all kinds of stuff that as I try and think about, uh, sorry, about giving a message that's so loving, that'll make all of you guys uh, sense the love and power of God. I kind of get overwhelmed uh, with being able to do it. And I know I'm going to make some mistakes along the way. So just like last week, I'm going to ask you guys, I'm going to give you grace for whatever your past is, whatever lifestyle you've been coming out of, whatever you're struggling with. I'll give you grace, but you give me grace as well. And if you agree again, just say the word grace. Because we're battling uh, in our culture. We're battling a multi-billion dollar misinformation campaign called the pornography industry that's designed to take us off tracks and move us in all the wrong directions. And gosh, I want to do my best in 30 minutes to try and help battle against that and give people a perspective that will help them to hear the voice of God in ways that are powerful and align their lives to God's purposes. So some of this is a mystery. As a matter of fact, uh, we established last week that men and women are different. And to guys, women are a mystery. Amen? I mean, when it comes to getting in the bedroom, men are very simple. Women are complicated. It is well represented by this diagram right here. Okay, men and women in the bedroom. That's how complicated things go. In fact, women are such a mystery that even the most brilliant men in the world have done their best. <laughs> to understand the mysteries of the universe they have, but I still don't understand women. You know, that, that's Einstein there. I've heard guys say, women should come with an instruction manual, but it wouldn't do any good because men wouldn't read it anyway. <laughs> the truth of the matter is that women, women are an incredible mystery. But guys, here's the deal. It's a good thing that your wife is a mystery and changing all the time because that keeps you interested in pursuing her over and over and over again. Not the same woman that you married. She is worth pursuing afresh. Amen? Amen. Oh, come on, guys. 
<laughs> that mystery thing I'm not too sure about. So here's what I'm going to do for the rest of this message is I'm going to try and unpack some of the mystery around married sex. I'm going to tell you where I'm going and then we're going to go there, okay? So I'm going to start off in the beginning of the message and we're going to talk about the spiritual nature of married sex and God's intent for it, including pleasure and kids. And then we're going to head towards how it got wrecked. And the idea that Satan's after ruining all of this good stuff. And then we'll head towards how God is redeeming that. That's the flow of the message today. And if you're ready to head towards that flow, say, I'm ready. ready. All right, so we're going to start at the beginning with the idea of the mystery. Now, I'm convinced that married sex is not just something that happens between two people with body parts coming together. But instead, it's a picture of where we're headed for the future. In fact, my first point is this. God is giving us clues through our sex lives about a future union that's about to come. And this is pretty mysterious. What I want to do is take you to three different passages that give us hints that there's something at play that's way bigger than what we're experiencing right now. The first one comes from Ephesians chapter 5 near the end, and it says this. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother... And be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. You recognize that's coming straight out of Genesis right there. Paul's quoting Genesis. And then he says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Whoa, stop. Er, Back up the truck. He says, I'm talking about sex, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Let's read this again. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And this is a profound mystery But I'm talking about Christ and the church. So what what does sex have to do with Christ and the church? Well, here's the truth about you. Is that you are not just a body with a soul or a body with a mind and a will. You're in your essence a spirit that is embodied by a body that carries along with it a mind and a will, and they all work together to make you who you are. But there is this spiritual component of you that when you come to faith in Christ, there is a mysterious union with Christ. And as we think about Christ and the church, picture husband and wife throughout the Bible. You know, Christ and the church are pictured as a husband and wife. There is this mysterious union that our sexuality is a pointer to. Now, can I explain that in detail? No way. It's a profound mystery. In fact, I'm convinced that Paul couldn't explain it in detail. That's why he said, this is a profound mystery. Because he couldn't figure it out either. But there is something mysterious about the union that we have with Christ that's going to get bigger and better. Because as the church, billions of people in the church become united with Christ, we become united with him like a husband and a wife become united. And there is a profound mystery in what's happening behind this. Now, I'm convinced that not only is this a reference to how things are now, but that God is also setting us up for a future. Because there will come a day when all people, whether you are married or not on planet Earth, all people will be united with Christ in this, re- in this representative ceremony called the Wedding Supper of the Lamb. So in Revelation chapter 19 and 20, it describes this moment when everybody gets raptured and judged and we all go before Jesus, that there's a huge party called the Wedding Supper of the Lamb. And then after that, for millennia, what the churches have called the consummation of Christ. And we know what that is a reference to. So I'm trying to rack my brain and think, okay, is this like a a weird kind of billions of people sex with Christ? I don't think that's what the Bible is talking about at all. But he's talking about a profound and mysterious union that's coming down the pike between Christ and his church to which our sexuality is a pointer. All right, let me give you another verse here. This is Matthew 19, verse 16. It heads in the same direction. He's talking about divorce in this context, and he says, So people are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Okay, I think what this teaches us in this passage is that when people get married, we're not just married by a decision of the will. 
We're not just married by the legality of our culture. We're not just married by making a commitment before one another. But in a spiritual way, there is something that happens that God has joined together. What God has joined together, let no one separate. This is one of the reasons why issues of adultery and even divorce are so profoundly disturbing because it's not just what's happening in the seen and known and physical world that's getting torn apart. There's something in the heavenlies that's getting torn apart as well. And again, I just want to reiterate, if you're someone who comes from a divorce perspective, there's grace for you and there's all kinds of stories that are behind that. But we can't get away from this profound mystery that marriage is not only the union of two people, but there's a spiritual union that's taking place in the heavenly realms that we need to take very seriously. Okay, third verse I want to point to is this one. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and it says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Okay, there's a ton to unpack in this little set of verses. The idea that you're, you're not your own. You belong to Jesus by, at this point. And so what you do with your bodies is not just your choice. When you have a union with Christ, you have this powerful responsibility to Jesus to steward the body that he gave you well. But not only that, it says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, quick historical review here. If you go back in the Bible to the time of Moses, the first time that God hung out in the midst of his people was in the tabernacle, this tent in the middle of his people. Then that became permanent in the temple. That was the dwelling place of God amongst his people. Then when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn open, the Holy Spirit burst free and began living in the lives of people like you and me, ordinary people. And so we became the temple of the Holy Spirit From that moment on. Now this is a powerful thought that you and I are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So the way that we treat our bodies is a reflection of what we think of God's temple and where the Holy Spirit lives. This is where the rubber meets the road between the Holy Spirit and this world is our lives. And so if you go back to the beginning of the passage, it says, flee sexual immorality. Because everything else happens outside your body, but this happens inside the temple of the Holy Spirit in a place that Jesus owns, a body that he's created and given to you, and now he's reclaimed for himself. And when you sin sexually, it's a bigger deal because it's a sin against your own body. You are not your own. And so when that takes place, it's an affront not only in the normal sense that you would think about, But there are spiritual ripples that we could never consider in our current union with Christ and the future union that you're headed to. Are you guys confused still? I am, but I hope it's a little bit more clear to you. Now, I'm convinced that our sex life have massive spiritual ripples. And I think that God gave us this joy in our sex lives in order to get a picture of what's going to come in the future. In fact, I think God wants us to know just how electrified that we're going to be at the wedding supper of the Lamb and the consummation of Christ and the joy that we'll experience for all eternity. He says, I want to give them a shadowy picture of what it's going to look like there. So when married sex is working really, really good, that's a picture of what's going to be like for all of us for all eternity. And this is good news. Amen. Amen. It's the good news that God has given us uh, for this day. Now, our sex lives are designed to be something that's really good. In fact, I'm convinced that God delights in your delight. Let's read that together. God delights in your delight. And this is good news, too, that God wants us to be able to take joy in our sex lives. In fact, there's a whole book of the Bible that's committed to the idea that God wants us to have pleasure in sex. It's called the book Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. And it's a collection of love poetry between a couple of young people who are exploring sex with each other. 
Some people try to spiritualize the book, but it is just not spiritualizable if you're honestly reading the book. It's a book that's about sex, and I think God put a whole book in the Bible related to that because he wants us to realize that this is a good thing that he wants us to take joy in. In Song of Songs 6.3, it says, I am my beloved's and he is mine. He browses among the lilies. Now you may say, what does it mean he browses among the lilies? I'm going to leave that for you to explore later on as you read the Song of Solomon. But there's profound symbolism, lilies and gardens and cedar posts and twin fawns of a gazelle and all of them symbolize. Those of you who are reading Song of Songs are like, I know what that means. They all symbolize something beautiful and powerful that God wants to create this stunning, bonding agent between people who are married to each other. In fact, people who study brain chemistry know that sexuality gives you one of the most powerful hormone dumps of anything that you can do. Let me give you a few of the hormones that are dumped that are evidence that God loves you and wants you to have a great sex life. One of them is oxytocin. It's known as the cuddle hormone. It's released not just during sex, but during any skin-to-skin contact. Holding hands, kissing, hugging, laying together naked, all those kinds of things releases oxytocin. And it makes you feel warmth towards a person. It actually increases trust and empathy and lowers your defenses. Now, this is a specially strong release inside of women. And women, i got to give you a warning, because oxytocin does not have any discernment to it at all. So if you're not married and you're having sex with a guy who's a marriage material or a slime ball, oxytocin does not know the difference. And it will make you trust and have empathy towards that person. That's why so many girlfriends complain, I don't have any idea what she sees in that guy. You know what she sees in that guy? oxytocin and all the lies that come along with it. So be careful there. But it's a beautiful thing inside of marriage. All right, the next one is dopamine. Someone say dopamine. Dopamine is the thrill hormone. It's the one that makes you feel like, oh man, my body is fully charged and is exploding at this moment. It's the one that causes you to keep coming back for more. It's the one that helps us to fulfill the first command that God gave us to be fruitful and multiply. Now, a dopamine dump during sex is not only a great thrill, but a Princeton University study says that it actually helps you grow new brain cells. So sex makes you smarter. That's good news, I think. (laughs) Not only that, but another study says that sexually active older people are less likely to have dementia, dementia than those who are not sexually active, which gives you a totally new meaning to the phrase crazy in love. All right, the third one, okay, that was a bad pun. It's okay, it's okay. We're in church, we do bad puns. Grace, thank you, yeah, I needed that. (laughs) Serotonin, serotonin is the bliss hormone. It's the hormone that's critical for fighting depression. So if you're somebody who's fighting depression, sometimes the last thing you wanna do is have sex, but it can be the best thing to help you fight depression at the same time. And the last thing is endorphins. Endorphins are our body's natural painkiller. And it's interesting that during the the act of sex, oftentimes other pieces of pain in your life disappear in the background because of the endorphins that are being released in that moment. God gives us incredible joy chemically, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, endorphins. It's just one more piece of evidence of the grace of God towards us. So why does God give us all this joy when we're encountering our spouse in a way that is uh, sexual? Well, I think it's because of one key reason, and that's this. Marriage is hard. Marriage is hard. So we need to have this emotional bonding agent that keeps us glued to that other person with joy, even when times are hard. Everything that's good in life is hard, right? Winning a championship is hard. Raising kids is hard. Marriage is hard. But God so desires for us to stay married for a lifetime that he gives us this emotional and chemical glue that bonds us together and reflects something bigger spiritually. Now, I know what some guys are thinking already. They're saying, wow, if all this happens during sex, if we got problems in our marriage, what we need is more sex. 
And I just want to tell you guys, this is not the same thing that your wife is thinking right now. Okay? If you got emotional problems, the problem happens before the act of sex. Because you remember, a woman's brain is like a ball of wire where everything is connected to everything else. And so that text you sent earlier this morning is important. And those words that you said to her of encouragement on the phone are really important. And you putting the toilet seat down every single time is really important. And all of them act together in a way that sets yourself up for a healthier emotional life. Because women want to have the emotional closeness before sex. Men get the emotional closeness because of sex. And we got to figure out how we love each other so that both get the emotional closeness. Amen? All right, that was a non-enthusiastic amen, but I'll trust that you're with me. Well, here's, here's the deal. God not only wants us to experience delight in our sex life, but God also wants a context to raise godly kids. In fact, he says this very clearly in Malachi 2.15. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and in spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard. And don't be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. God actually desires for us as the family of God to produce godly offspring. It's one of the things that he wants from us. In fact, as God thinks about the next generation, he knows that some of the most healthy contributors to the next generation, spiritually, financially, leadership-wise, educationally, in every way, are going to be people that were raised by a godly mom and a godly dad. All the studies support this that the best way to raise kids is in a family where a man and a woman are committed to one another for a lifetime. All the studies would affirm that people do better in school and in sports, and they stay out of jail, and they stay off drugs, and they stay committed in their marriage later, and they do better financially, all in the context of a family who's devoted to one another for a lifetime. Malachi says, if you want godly offspring, listen, be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. Because he knows that if there's unfaithfulness that happens, it tears at the fabric of the marriage and it tears at that deep spiritual fabric that we were talking about. And it has a profound impact on your children. So if you're thinking about an affair, if you're on the brink of an affair, if you're on the midst, in the midst of an affair then it's time to swerve hard and become faithful to your husband, become faithful to your wife, because God wants it not only for you and your pleasure, but also for the next generation. Which leads us to our third point. If marriage is profoundly spiritual, and it's designed for pleasure, and it's designed for godly offspring, well, then we got to realize that there is an enemy who will tear at our sex lives. I think he realizes that this is one of the most powerful things that human beings encounter. So if he can wreck our sex lives, he can do a deep work at wrecking our life overall. And the Bible says this much in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And uh, he's become really good at this in the sexual arena. I think that he does this by priming the pump through pornography, exposing us to it as early as possible. Studies show that as, men, as much as 60% of men and 30% of women are addicted to pornography. And this porn sets up unrealistic expectations and makes us want what we don't have. It teaches us all the wrong things with every video and every picture, and it conditions our brain to computers and pictures rather than to real people. I think that Satan reaps destruction by childhood abuse and premarital sex. He wants people, women especially, to walk into marriage already brokenhearted, hopefully broken over and over, in order to make sex distasteful and make it harder to bond, even with a good man. Satan makes affairs available to people who are vulnerable and bored and tired and lonely. He points to that majestic spiritual bonding that God wants for everybody, and he wants to trash it 
as a person unites their body with another person. Not only that, but he throws tons of barriers into even well-intentioned, committed, married people in the middle of their sex lives. I want to live in the reality of this for a minute here because this is one of those things that we never talk about in church, the challenges of sex inside of marriage. Because studies say that 50% of married people are satisfied with their sex lives, which means 50% of them are not satisfied. So single people, if you're looking around at all of your married friends and saying they've all got it going, you're probably about 50% right as you look at the grass on the other side of the fence. Married people, I was thinking of this. If if we reflect the broader studies, that means that 50% of people are not happy in their sex lives right now. Now, I don't think that that means that 50% are perpetually happy and 50% are perpetually unhappy. When I talk to guys and I counsel them, what I've found is that nearly every guy that I talk to has had at least one chapter of their life that's been a painful chapter in the sexual arena. Married guys who love their wives and are deeply committed to them. And maybe that's where you're at right now. If the 50% rule is true, if you're married for 40 years, that may mean that 20 of those years you'll spend in a sexually frustrated position. And I'll tell you a few of the reasons that I've heard from people that I talk to about why married people are not having sex. They range from raw exhaustion to sickness to unfaithfulness to a physical dysfunction that makes sex painful rather than pleasurable to bad memories of the past experiences to being taught from a young age that sex is dirty. And when you decide early on that you're going to be committed to one man or to one woman for the rest of your life, it actually accelerates how hard your sex life can be. I actually think that married sexuality can sometimes be harder than the bed hopping uh, idea. And here's why. Because when there's a problem in your marriage, you stick with it. You're never going to abandon that person and say, ah, we didn't get married anyway, so I'm going on to the next person. No, 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 you made a commitment of love for a lifetime, for better or for worse, even in the bedroom. So if your spouse is medically incapacitated, perpetually exhausted, distracted, or emotionally distant, you still stay with them. And friends, I want you to know today that God wants you to still stay with them because he's molding something in you that's much bigger than your sex life. And that takes us to our fourth point. That's this, that God is schooling us in sacrifice and submission. God is schooling us in sacrifice and submission. In 1 Corinthians 7, here's the verses that talk about this principle. It says this, Each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. And in the same way, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. A couple important things to point out about this passage. You know, it's interesting that sometimes Paul is accused of being a male chauvinist. But what he's doing in this passage is wildly egalitarian. I mean, nobody would be surprised by this principle here. The wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. That was common practice in the ancient world. What would be radical and almost unthinkable is the next sentence. In the same way, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Friends, this is a powerful picture for us that invites us into all kinds of fresh thinking. If my body is not my own, what does that mean for me? What does it mean for the way that I dress? What does it mean for the way I flirt at the office? What does it mean for the way that I engage in male-female relationships in general? What does it mean for what I eat, for how I work out, for the way that I treat my own body? All of these things are affected by the idea that my body is not my own. It's also my wife's, and 
her body is mine, and actually both of our bodies belong to Jesus. Your body is not your own. But there's also a solution to a number of sexual problems that are in here, and it comes through the idea of mutual self-giving of love. This is one of the things that Paul teaches in marriage all the time. Like in Ephesians chapter 5, he teaches, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Marriage, according to Paul, is a perpetual race for the bottom, where you're seeking out the pleasure and well-being of the other person more than you're seeking it out for yourself. So when it comes to the bedroom, the same principle applies. It's just like love, you get more when you give it away. The same thing is true in sex. You get more when you give it away. And that your desire is to seek the pleasure of the other person. And in so doing, it accelerates it for both people. Now let me take this and apply it to a real common thing that couples experience. Because in almost every couple relationship, there's one person who wants it more and one person who wants it less. And just randomly we'll assume that it's the guy who wants it more and the wife who wants it less. Not saying that's commonly true. Actually, it is commonly true. But it's not always true that that's the case. And you say, okay, how do we go about negotiating that? Well, here's the deal. The spouse who wants more loves his wife by exercising self-control in moments that are not desirable moments for her. And the spouse who wants it less exercises love by self-giving and initiating and training themselves to take joy in that, even if it may not be their their first preference. But God wants you to love your spouse by taking care of your body and self-giving your body to the other person. So submission is an obvious application of this. Not depriving each other of sex is an obvious application of this. But I want you to know, men and women, that your sex life is a training ground. That God is training you to be unselfish like Jesus. He's molding something in your character that's far deeper. So that when you go through those hard times, and I'm not saying if, I'm saying when you go through those hard times, pursue your spouse with all your heart and pursue Jesus with all your heart. And you'll find that he's molding something deep and powerful inside of you. I'm convinced that some of the heroes of the married world are the women who are loving their husbands by having sex with them, even if they prefer it less often, or if your husband is not emotionally available or well-connected. Women, you're becoming more like Jesus as you submit to him and to your husband. The other heroes are the husbands who are loving their wives, even in a low sex or sexless marriage, by being faithful and serving and loving and providing. And guys, I want to let you know that you are becoming more like Jesus as you submit to him and as you submit to your wife in this way. Marriages go through hard times and good times. And I thought today it might be helpful to give you a picture of a marriage right here at Christ Community Church and how it might weather a tough chapter. Check this out. This is the story of Mark and Sharon. My name is Mark Montagna. I'm currently pastor of counseling and director of operations at City Care Counseling. My name is Sharon Montaigne. I've been married to Mark Montagna for 25 years. My wife and I and our children began attending Christ Community Church in 2010. I grew up in a Catholic family, five older brothers, parents who were married for 50 years until my dad passed away. You know, there's a pretty significant level of brokenness that existed from a very young age until I was 12 years old and I went to live with my grandparents. Um, The brokenness exists, there was sexual brokenness, there was abuse, there was Uh, abuse that came in the form of verbal abuse, physical abuse, all of those things would come back and have a significant impact on Sharon and I's marriage. We got married in March of 93, and I was pregnant within a couple of months. And two and a half years later, we had our third son. We were loving life and each other. She was happy. She got to stay home and do what it was she wanted to do, which was raise the children and be a stay-at-home mom. And I got to work really hard, and I, I, was, I loved working. Um, so one of the things that we felt like would advance my career and my ability to support the family was I would go back to school. 
So I went back to school in 1999, um, and two years into going to school, um, was doing really well, but Sharon wasn't doing well at all. She didn't think that I was paying enough attention to her, that the family wasn't important to me, that um, going to school and, and getting praise and accolades for uh, what I was doing at UNO was more important to me. And the reality is that she was right. So she said, you know, what's true for us is uh, you either have to quit school or we're gonna probably get divorced. I would say I became extremely angry. And I remember vowing to myself, driving down Knott Street, that when the kids were old enough, I was gonna leave. I had no idea whatsoever that he wasn't happy. I didn't recognize it and nobody called me on it. Nobody said anything, so life went on. I detached myself from from Sharon and the kids in some ways. And one of the ways uh, that I did that was I started, uh, um, started exploring pornography in ways that I hadn't before. Uh, but it was, it was very passive aggressive for me. I would withhold sex from her. Um, I would not be engaged with her, uh, sometimes for months at a time. And I would, I would use pornography as a way to, uh, to get away from her in some ways. There was this vow that lived in the back of my mind and in my heart what I believed was she doesn't need me, the kids don't need me anymore, I'm just a paycheck. And it was in that moment where I really, it's something clicked in my mind, this is the time, this is the time to go. Rock bottom for me was March 16th, the day after my birthday in 2010. And I went up to put the kids to bed and I was walking up the stairs and he said, I need to talk to you. And I thought it was odd the way he said it. So I went downstairs and he was on the couch and he said, I'm, gonna, I'm leaving, I'm gonna file for divorce. I remember praying <laughs> that he would die because it would be easier if he would just die. And I prayed for that for months. He had some visitation time with the kids that he would pick them up and take them for the day and stuff. And he, I hadn't let him back in the house, not one foot in the house um, since the day he had left. I knew that there was something missing in my life and I didn't know what it was. And I, I just didn't believe in God. I thought people who believed in God were weak minded and they didn't, they needed something to uphold their lives. And uh, I, was, I was stronger than that. I didn't need that in my life. I had had some experience with church when I was a little boy, but in March of 2010, I started going to church and got involved in a Bible study. And I really started to understand who Jesus was for the first time. Um, but there was still something that was a key component in my life that I, I wasn't aware of yet. And, you know, I asked somebody at the time, I said, who is this Holy Spirit that everybody keeps talking about? And when that was explained to me, oh, just changed my life. Once I accepted him for who he is, uh, that's when my whole life changed. I uh, went to a counseling session with Sharon and the boys and uh, I told them, hey, something's changed in me. And in July of 2010, I remember sitting some, some, on some stairs by myself and we had just gotten in a, an argument about money. And I got off the phone with her and I, in my mind I said, you know, I, I can't talk to her like that anymore. That's, that's not okay. Something hit me in that moment. Uh, and I believe it was the hand of God. And I, I literally said out loud, the rest of my life, whatever I have left is yours. You can have it all. And I gave him my life that day. He had changed. And what I didn't realize till later, but he had died and was born again because he was a different person. The secret to change comes in the surrender piece. Surrendering your life to Christ and, and saying to him with all of your heart, with all of your spirit, my life is yours now and I surrender it to you. Um, I really believe that that surrender is what changed everything for me. Hey, can we thank Mark and Sharon for their willingness to share a vulnerable story with us?
You know, I hope you caught what Sharon said uh, at the end there. You know, where she said, at one point I was praying that he would die. And then later on I realized that he died and was born again. And I just want you to know, if you're in the throes of one of those really challenging marriage situations like Mark and Sharon was, that there is hope for you. Jesus is in the business of rewriting people's stories, writing happier endings, just like he's all about writing better sermons at 9 o'clock at night. He's about rewriting your story in order to match his purposes. You are not too far gone. Now, I know that people have come into this talk with lots of different experiences. Some of you are happily married and happily enjoying sex, and that's awesome. If that's the case, high five your spouse. Not right now, (laughs) but later on tonight in the bedroom, you can high five and more. Other people may have a conviction that's come to you from the Holy Spirit. I mean, maybe you're a single person who's just saying, I'm going to double down on purity until the time I'm married. Maybe you're a married person that has to have an honest conversation with your spouse. Maybe you're somebody who's on the brink of an affair and you've you got to swerve hard in order to avoid that. Maybe you just want to grow deeper in your union with Christ and your wife and explore the spiritual power that's behind that. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what it would be for you, but I pray and trust that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you today. And I'd love to pray over you in that regard. So would you stand all over the room? And uh, before we pray, I just want to let you know that Christ Community has immense resources available to help you in your marriage. we got classes for people that are in a healthy marriage that just want it to go better. Got classes for people who are grieving the loss of a spouse. Groups that are there for folks who have been divorced. People who, who are going through marriage troubles. we got counselors at City Care Counseling, pastoral counselors. We'll have people after the service right up here in the front who would love to pray with you if you got something you want to have prayed for. If you want to go to the prayer room in this hallway and receive prayer, that would be awesome too. But we just want to let you know that we're here to serve you wherever you're at and trust that the Holy Spirit is going to work in your life. So let's pray together and invite God to do his mysterious work today. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to be present and powerful in the room today. We pray, God, that you would heal us in the broken places, that you would give us bigger thrills in the places that are riding really well. We pray that you'd give us a deeper love for you, and if we're married, a deeper love for our spouse, and that you would use this time together in order to accelerate your purposes in our hearts and our minds for the sake of your kingdom. May we give ourselves to you afresh, and God, I pray that you'll draw men and women to yourself as you draw them closer to each other. And we ask this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people agreed and said, amen. 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 God bless you all.